Janet Cook crafted a tale so outlandish that even Jerry Springer would have doubts. This is the story of the eight-year-old heroin addict that never was. Janet Cook is determined to make front page news to the Washington Post. She has scored the interview of a lifetime, or as her boss, executive editor Ben Bradley likes to call it, a holy sh story. The young woman is going to speak with an eight-year-old boy who's addicted to a much stronger form of heroin. His mother, Andrea, also an addict, agrees to let the 26-year-old reporter document her findings under one condition, total anonymity. After all, she's about to witness a serious case of child endangerment, neglect, and just straight-up abuse. Janet accepts the terms and conditions. She names the subject of her piece, Jimmy. He is sitting in a reclining chair, boasting about his new kicks. He's cocky, but there's also something really sweet about him, in spite of his circumstances. He tells Janet that he dreams of following in Ron's footsteps. Jimmy wants to sell on the district's meanest street, Condon Terrace, a place where shootings and kneecappings are common. He says he would spend his dough on a German Shepherd, a bicycle, maybe a basketball. Although Jimmy doesn't really attend school that often, his favorite subject is math because it will come in handy one day. I pretty much pay attention to math because I know I got to keep up when I finally get me something to sell, he says. The fourth grader hangs out with older kids around 11 all the way up to 16, which makes sense because he's had to grow up so quickly. It's unlikely that he can even relate to children his own age. He has seen too much. Jimmy is basically a child in a very adult world. So how does an eight-year-old get hooked to heroin in the first place. Ron provides the answer to that burning question. He'd be bugging me all the time about what the shots were and what people was doing. And one day he said, when can I get off? I said, well, sh you can have some now. I let him snort a little and damn, the little dude really did get off. Jimmy was five years old at the time. He became a full blown addict within six months. Andrea is pretty nonchalant about her son's drug use. I think he would have gotten into it one day anyway. Everybody does. When you live in the ghetto, it's all a matter of survival. If he wants to get away from it when he's older, then that's his thing. Drugs and black folk been together for a very long time. You guys, all of that was bull complete and utter bull. Jimmy was a composition of stories Janet had gotten from social workers. Cook had been fabricating her own version of the truth since she was a little girl. Growing up in Toledo, she developed the habit as a way to cope with her father's overly controlling nature. Apparently, he wouldn't let his wife or daughter buy a skirt without his seal of approval. So Janet just bought it behind his back and the lies spilled over into other areas of her life, namely her professional life. For example, the resume she submitted to her boss all make believe. She never graduated from Vassar. She only attended freshman year. And it actually got her bachelor's at the University of Toledo. And the claims of being fluent in Portuguese and Italian? Also hogwash. Fake it till you make it was her motto, I suppose. Mike Sager, a former boyfriend and one of the weekly staff writers at the Post, called their relationship a painful, exhilarating psychodrama. She once called Mike to tell him that she had swallowed an entire bottle of Valium and later confessed that she was the lies, the lies, the lies. But seriously, you've got to hand it to her. Janet's lies had served her well, at least they did professionally. And so it's obvious that she was under the impression that her latest fib would only bring her closer to her goal of being the best in the world of journalism. When Jimmy's World hit newsstands on Sunday, September 28th, 1980, everyone was buzzing about Janet's article. She was that girl. And if anyone in the newsroom questioned the validity of her story, she asserted that it was nothing more than hate. They're just jealous. They're not going where I'm going. Cook was all too aware of the climate. Let me paint a clear picture for you. It's the 80s and the Washington Post is still a predominantly white male environment. Within nine months, she had already become feature writer at the Post. Janet had accomplished things that veteran journalists could only dream about. No one wanted to be labeled a hater, a misogynist, or even worse, a racist. So they just kept their skepticism to themselves. While her colleagues gossiped about her, the mayor, Marion Barry, assigned a task force of several police officers as well as social workers 
to locate the boy. Residents and housing projects wanted to rescue Jimmy as well. They offered a $10,000 reward. Teachers around the city began to pay close attention to students with a similar background. Everyone was on the hunt for the drug addicted little boy. Two days after the piece was published, police made it clear that they meant business. They actually threatened to subpoena Janet and have her identify Jimmy, but the post wouldn't budge. Instead, they cited the First Amendment. Janet was in the clear, or so she thought. Time had passed, and so had the public's interest in the heroin-addicted boy. John Lennon's murder, the Arthur McDuffie riot, and AIDS was what was on everyone's mind as of late, and Janet was relieved. She was actually in the midst of working on another piece that was sure to stir up controversy, a profile of a teenage prostitute. All was well until Bob Woodward, assistant managing editor, submitted her story, Jimmy's World, for the Pulitzer for feature writing. On April 13, 1981, Cook was awarded the prestigious prize, and she was scared to death. My life is over. What am I going to do? Janet thought to herself. The Associated Press featured biographical profiles about the winners, and editors at Janet's former place of employment, the Toledo Blade, noticed some discrepancies, so they contacted the Post. Janet's resume was the clown that came back to bite. The Post's reputation was at stake here. Enough was enough. Just who was Janet Cook? Ben Bradley was on a mission to find out. He, along with managing editor Howard Simons, investigative journalist Bob Woodward, and Milton Coleman, a city editor, joined forces and interrogated Janet for 11 whole hours. They were not playing with her. They took her to a bar, and I think the motive behind that was the old adage, a drunk mind speaks a sober tongue, but Janet stuck to ginger ale. She didn't fold. When that failed, her boss resorted to insults. He said that she was just like Nixon. He was referring to Watergate. You guys, it didn't stop there. Next, the editors drove around the area where Janet had supposedly interviewed Jimmy in search of the boy. She couldn't locate him, of course. They went on to ask her to say something, anything, in any of the languages she claimed to be fluent in. And homegirl's French was that of a beginner, and she couldn't speak a lick of Portuguese. Realizing that the walls were closing in on her, Cook began to cry. The jig was officially up. At 1.45 a.m., she came clean. It was all a lie. Days later. On April 15th, 1981, the Post relinquished the Pulitzer and Janet issued an apology along with her resignation. Jimmy's world was in essence a fabrication. I never encountered or interviewed an eight-year-old addict. The September 28th, 1980 article in the Washington Post was a serious misrepresentation, which I deeply regret. <laughs> Life for Janet after this debacle was a nightmare. Janet went through some things. She could no longer sustain work as a writer. I mean, she had no credibility. Janet wound up working at a department store, and I guess some nosy person spilled the tea to the media, and a news crew showed up at her job. That was Janet's last day of work. That's pretty embarrassing. In an interview with the Today Show on February 1st, 1982, Janet stated that the pressure to produce front page stories is what led to her demise. There is an undercurrent of this kind of competitive competitiveness and of the need to be first, be flashiest, be sensational. She regretted the whole thing. I think it was wrong. I should not have done it. And at the time I wrote the story, I just felt horrible about it. I made a mistake. I have paid for it. And I'd like to be left in peace now. Final thoughts. Jimmy's world was like something out of a really bad Tyler Perry movie. It was the ultimate trauma corn. Janet did a huge disservice to African Americans. And I know what you're thinking. We're all individuals, blah, blah, blah. But that's just not the case. And you know it. Her willingness to just throw a routinely negatively stereotyped group under the bus so that she could shine was and still is disgusting. With that said, I have a little bit of sympathy for her. Sometimes wild ambition prevents people from seeing clearly. It's been 43 years since that article was published, and Janet Cook is still very much a joke within the print and media world. That's punishment enough. On the bright side, on February 27, 2020, producers Janet Mock and Ryan Murphy announced that they inked a deal to bring Cook's story to Netflix, and I look forward to seeing it.